What's up, everybody? Welcome on into this edition of War Chant TV. I'm Aslan Hajavani, joined by founder and administrator of WarChant.com, Gene Williams. It is the ultimate seminal sports source. Use the promo code WARCHANT30 if you're not already a member to get the best information possible. Latest, greatest from Florida State Athletics. We're continuing our recruiting retrospective. Uh, we've gone in chronological order, Gene, but, uh, you know, <laughs> why, not, why not have a little bit more of an uplifting show this time around? Let's uh, go much deeper into the recruiting vault and let's go to 2010, uh, a season that uh, was a very big turning point for Florida State's fortunes. And it's crazy because, obviously, the lead-up to that involved a uh, legendary head coach kind of being forced to step down. And there weren't a lot of good things going on with Florida State, but somehow this class became a, a crown jewel. Yeah, it really was. Well, first of all, I had to call an audible. I was getting a little tired of the, uh, you know, continuing to pressing under under class classes. Classes. Well, Let's jump ahead jump to a ahead class to a really kind of really smart things for Florida, Florida State. State. Yes. Yes. It's really, it's kind of neat when you look back when all those other classes had, you know, five stars fell short. You didn't really have very few guys overachieved. It was just mistake after mistake. You look at this one and it just jumps off the page of you with how well it was. Now it was a number 10, which by Florida State standards is pretty average, if not even slightly below average by standards. But in hindsight, it's really unbelievable what it did. Now, to lay a little bit of the groundwork, we all know 2009 was the, an awful season. <clears throat> it took a last-second comeback against Maryland to even become bowl eligible. and have it. We would have had that first losing season of Florida State in 2009 if not for that game. And ultimately what happened that season led to Bobby Bowden stepping down. And if you look, and I'm linking, if you go to the story, I've linked a story we did back in late 2009 about how Florida State's recruiting was really taking a hit. This was The class was going to be in big trouble. But then, as we know, early December, Jimbo Fisher, who had been the head coach in waiting, takes over full time as the head coach, hires a new staff, gets Mark Stoops in there, James Coley, Grant, all these other guys, really good recruiters, especially in South Florida, and uh, did a bang up job. I mean, we all talked about Willie Taggart's first year and how much he saved the class. But really, in hindsight, when you look at this, not only the highly regarded guys, but some of the other guys he signed or were able to keep in the fold down the stretch made a huge difference. Nine of those 24 guys all committed during Jimbo Fisher those last two months when he was the head coach. And a couple others, and, and this is big time players, I'm talking Bjorn Warner, Christian Jones, Kenny Shaw, LaMarcus Joyner, Jeff Luck, Mike Harris, and Terrence Brooks and uh, Telvin Smith were on their way out too. And he was able to basically bring them back in the fold as well. Can you imagine a class without all those guys? Um, it was humo tremendous what he did. And when you go, obviously, you look ahead to 2013, how many of these guys were major portions outside of Warner because he was so good he left school early after 2012. But, I mean, this was I mean, this was Jimbo Fisher at his finest. This was the, the hungry Jimbo Fisher, the outgoing Jimbo Fisher that just did a tremendous job, the, the great hire, the talent evaluator. I mean, you saw guys all over the board. We're going to talk about some of the guys that overachieved based on the ranking, and it, it's – I don't – think i've seen a class like it before yeah all right well uh, let's start i guess with the five stars that's always what uh, catches everybody's eyes uh two big names on there uh, i guess maybe the bell cow of the bunch was the, the smallest one of the bunch with the market shorter but two five stars always a good thing to have in your recruiting class yeah that's the thing when you get a guy like lamarcus joiner you know the number one player in the state I mean, to be able to come in when you got to remember this is on the heels of florida dominating with urban meyer with tim tebow and you're able to go into South Florida and pull out the state's number one player and a guy that everybody looked up to. This And Jimbo talked about this a lot in subsequent interviews we did with him after this, you know, all the way up to 2013. How LaMarcus Joyner and to some extent also Jeff Lux signing with him legitimized, the, legitimized him as a head coach, legitimized Florida State as a program because they were an afterthought in the late 2000s. But suddenly with his staff, they brought them back up to prominence. And to get a guy like that, I mean, there, I, don't, I have no doubt in my mind, if LaMarcus Joyner ends up going to Florida, let's say, I don't think we see that run to Florida State. Had they, they wouldn't have obviously had a great player, and they wouldn't have had a lot of the other guys that kind of followed him after that. So and we, we all know the history of how tremendous he was and what a big part of the program he was in 2013. And he's still doing great things in the NFL. And then a legacy kind of helped round out the bunch there with uh, Christian Jones coming into the fold. So uh, I remember that was one of those videos that I think they posted online where they showed the war room of them reacting to getting Christian Jones. Mm -hmm. So always good to get legacies on board, especially when they're a five-star. Yeah, that's the thing, too. I mean, as much as you say, he had obviously his father and brother played at Florida State, but it was it was a close battle. I mean, it went back and forth with him, with, I think, Notre Dame, Tennessee, Alabama. I mean, everybody was involved for this guy. And I think if not for, again, Jimbo Fisher and the staff, 
I don't think he ends up at Florida State, but he was able to, the staff did a good enough job recruiting him. He decided to follow the family legacy and come to Florida State. He kind of had an interesting, I don't think he had a, a bad career at Florida State, maybe not the level a lot of people thought. Started a lot of games, was productive. I think in 2012, he actually led the team at tackles at linebacker, but wasn't spectacular. And then he made that move to edge rusher in the 13th season to really help fill out that, that defense for Florida State, which finished number one in the country. Uh, four stars, not a uh, rare thing to see around Florida State's recruiting classes. It's always in bunches, but most classes kind of make their bones when it comes to uh, hitting good on the four stars. And that's really where Florida State uh, hit pay dirt, it seems like, when you look at this recruiting class. Yeah, really the fours and the threes. I mean, we'll talk about that in a minute. But, yeah, a couple of the four stars. We can talk about Telvin Smith. And this is one of the guys that I remember. I was I was lucky enough that first year that Jimbo Fisher invited me to be up there in the war room uh, with them. And to see the back and forth going on with Telvin Smith all day long. I mean, they had, a, I guess there was a counselor or a teacher or something. was a huge Georgia supporter at his school. And uh, she was pulling every shots, kept pulling him into the room, him and his mom trying to get him to go to Georgia. And apparently he was going back and forth the whole time. And you could see Jimbo Fisher wasn't shy about wearing emotions on his sleeve. And I can't share some of his, uh, some of the words he was saying while this was going on, but you know, he was relentless and did not give up on that staff. And it took a, it took all day, but they finally convinced him and he ended up signing with Florida State. And again, I don't know, just like Joyner, I don't know what that defense would have been in 2013 without having, having Telvin Smith, the leader, the, the linebacker core there. What a great player he was from Lowndes. And then, of course, the other one is Mr. Raw, Kenny Shaw, is the other four star we can talk about, too. And, you know, he really made it. You know, he was part of that three headed monster with Kelvin Benjamin. And Rashad Green and just Mr. Clutch, Mr. Consistent. And uh, I'll just never forget some of the – I don't ever remember him dropping a pass. And the one that always sticks in my mind is that 2013 game at Florida. Remember, FSU got off to that really slow start. And you're thinking, are they going to have some problem here? Florida had a really good defense that year. And I remember there was a third and long, and Jameis just threw it out over the middle and kind of, kind of laid Kenny Shaw to drive. But, man, he went up there grabbed the ball, took a huge, huge blow, held on to the football, and then all of a sudden after that, that got the offense clicking next thing you know, Florida State's pulling Florida out of the water. And uh, he was absolutely something. Didn't really make it in the NFL, but he's, he's still he had a couple good seasons in the CFL uh, the last few years. All right, so they hit on the five stars, which uh, usually you hope that you can. The four stars, uh, they did a really good job there as well, uh, Gene. But then the, the sort of under-recruited guys, the three stars, uh, really impressive what Florida State was able to get out of those recruits. Well, this is where Jimbo Fisher, I think, was his strength, and you would talk to him, it's his evaluation, his ability to scout players, see their strengths and weaknesses, and it was always, that was one of my favorite things about Coach Fisher was when he was in a, when he was in a good mood, it didn't happen all the time, but sometimes he was, he'd go off the record and talk X's and O's with you, and to hear him talk about players, he would talk about shoe size, he would talk about just everything, you know, bone structure, wingspan, I mean, he'd go into all these tangibles and all the intangibles that made guys great players, so, you know, these are some of the guys that did it. Bjorn Warner. I mean, he was he was an afterthought. Will Ty was the guy they were recruiting up in Connecticut, and Bjorn Warner caught their eye, obviously. Only played football for a couple of years. He was an exchange student from Germany, and uh, they got in on him late. But, man, when they when they turned up the, the heat on him, they were able to get him here. We know what he did, and he was a first-team All-American, first-round draft pick. And uh, kind of wish he would have hung out one more year for that 2013 season. It's, it, as good as that defense is, I can't even imagine if they had – uh, you know, Warner on defense as well. That would have been just absolutely sick, but a great player. Uh, Cameron Irving, another one. What a great story he was. When he first committed to Florida State, he was a two-star. He was a two-star defensive lineman. His only other offer was Georgia Southern. Now, he blew up a little bit of senior season, started to get some other scholarship offers, got bumped up to a three-star, but here's a guy that started for three seasons, moved, played basically every position on the line in 2014, ended up playing half the season at center when they need him, did a great job there and has been outstanding in the NFL first round draft pick ever since. And last one, we got to bring up Terrence Brooks. Uh, you know, he's another guy that, man, they were, Florida State almost lost him and Florida State did a great job, especially Mark Stoops got in there, was able to re-recruit him when they almost lost him. And, uh, you know, it was a linchpin of that secondary in 2012 and 13 and one of those leaders and just a consistent guy that brought everybody together so uh man when you nailed it on those three guys who were all three stars relatively under recruited guys and they become became just absolute superstars of florida state you can't be always hitting home runs when it comes to recruiting there's always going to be a couple guys that maybe kind of fall short of the expectations at least the ones that fans set for them um but you know jeff luke's a guy that you mentioned yeah. and i mean just 
you want to talk about a guy that you know looked the part and all that kind of good stuff, but one of those sort of guys that always left you wondering, man, what, what could have been? Yeah, I was kind of surprised he didn't make it, man. He had all the everything you'd want out of a guy who's the number one rated inside linebacker that year, came to Florida State. He battled a couple injuries. He couldn't get himself up on the depth chart. And I think if he would have hung out a little bit longer and stayed with the program, I still think he could have made an impact. Transferred to Cincinnati, and actually, I think it was last year there, had 133 tra- tackles, uh, led the team that year. Uh, had a little, Got a little bit of a cup of coffee in the NFL. Not sure he did great there, but, you know, a guy that just kind of, Again, was a little anxious to get out. I'm sure we'll see more and more of that with a transfer he was. And the other one was Christian Green. I was always surprised didn't work out. He was a Rivals 100 guy. Down, I think he was down in your neck of the woods, right? Down in Tampa. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And, um, you know, look, I mean, he played quarterback. And usually those guys were able to make that transition. I mean, you go to Anquan Bolden, Peter Warwick, Chris Davis. All those guys played quarterback in high school because they were the best athlete. He was the same way. And you thought, just give him a year or two, and he'll make that. Now, I to Jimbo Fisher's credit, man, he gave him opportunity after opportunity. He kept You kept wondering, why is he starting games? He's out there all the time and he's not productive, but Jimbo Fisher kept giving him chances. But eventually, you know, the, the Rashad Greens, the Kenny Shaws, Rodney Smith there for a while, um, Kelvin Benjamin, you know, they were just too good to keep off the field. So he really never produced much at Florida State. Yeah, that one little spark, though, wasn't it 14, I think, in Raleigh against NC State? Like, Jameis's first game back from the suspension. I think he had a touchdown yeah. catch that kind of sparked the – Yeah, yeah, I think, the, yeah, yeah, I think that was his back. one touchdown in his career. Yeah. But, yeah, he showed a little flashes here and there. That's probably why Jimbo Fisher kept giving him a shot. He goes, man, he's a little bit of confidence, a catch here or there, and maybe he can be a real productive receiver. But for whatever reason, it just never clicked with him. All right. One of the guys, man, we know um, – talk about what could have been was a guy that never got to campus, um, Faith. I guess, played a, a part <laughs> in uh, Matt Elam's recruitment to uh, end up in Gainesville over Tallahassee. But that was one of the more uh, bizarre recruiting sort of twists and sogs of that recruiting year. There were so many interesting stories. When you're recruiting against Urban Meyer, man, you can anything. He will put any stop, as we know, to uh, recruit somebody. But not even I'm getting off on a tangent, but I, I forget who it was. There was a, a quarterback there recruiting. I think it was after Tebow's first year. I think he was backing up Chris Leak at that point. But he got a lot of playing time. He's going to be a starter. And he told a quarterback that they were recruiting at the time that Tebow was going to be moved to fullback. I mean, he would say anything to get a recruit. So I think he realized that Matt Elam's family was very religious. So he pulled out the faith after he had flipped. Now, this is a guy that was committed to Florida. I remember Urban Meyer was having his health problems, whatever the deal was, where it looked like he was going to step down. Then he flipped his commitment to Florida State. Urban Meyer decided to stay and then pulled out the faith card on Matt Elam and his family and was able to convince him because of his faith to come back. And it's a great player for Florida. He was outstanding. I'm sure Florida State could have used him. But at the end of the day, those uh, he probably regrets that decision because Florida was on the way down coming, going into 2010. And the faith, the guy who espoused faith obviously left Matt Elam after one year where uh, Florida State went on to bigger and better things. And we're not poking fun at organized religion, folks. It's just the, the, no, the, no, 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 sort no. of the yeah. irony of, of Urban Meyer, obviously, was had one foot out the door. I think it was maybe after the Cincinnati Bowl game they played where he was going to step away from the game. And there was rumors rolling about him you know, retiring prematurely. And that's what made Elam kind of look at Tallahassee. And then all of a sudden, Urban Meyer comes back. And it's like, can, can you really believe a guy who said maybe a few days ago he's leaving? And Urban Meyer's pitch of him was like, you know, you just, just got to have faith in, in me and the process and that kind of stuff. So... Uh, just to clarify that. All right, Gene. So ultimately, you know, they couldn't get everybody. Everybody didn't pan out. But boy, oh boy, most everybody else uh, did. Uh, this 2010 class, you know, we always talk about legacy and how sort of, you know, trite of award overuse it is when we do these sort of debate things, I guess, or retrospective pieces. But I mean, the 2010 recruiting class, it, it, maybe not that 85 class, but pretty close, maybe. I mean, what, what do you think about 2010 when you think about recruiting in Florida State? Yeah, I think if I, that's a good question. Uh, at some point, I probably ought to go back and rank the all-time classes, at least do the top five, top ten. I think this would definitely be top ten, maybe even top five all-time, especially when you look at the circumstances. When you look at where Florida State was uh, landscape-wise in 2009, with the coaching change taking place, where Florida was, they were on top of the world, and the fact that Florida State was able to come in and you know, assign such a great class, especially in retrospect. It was a top ten class, eh. but, man, in hindsight, if you compare how many guys this – Hand out on this class compared to some of those might have been the number one or two class in the country that year for a program that was, you know, 
barely 500 the year before. So that was really impressed with they were able to do that. And, you know, you always look just objectively. You look at how many draft picks. They had six guys drafted off of this group. I think there were three first-rounders, a bunch of All-Americans in this class. Obviously, you know, they, they helped them win the 2013 National Championships, ACC Championships in 2012 and 13. And this set, set the stage, and I don't know if we'll, where we'll go in the next class, but obviously it set, set the stage for 2011 and 12, some great classes there as well. So they kept building on each other, which is what you do in recruiting, and that's how you become a great program. Good. That's the thing. That was Jimbo's first ever class, and it's like, boy, oh, boy, man, it's never going to end. This train stops for nobody. <laughs> uh, but all good things, uh, unfortunately, did come to an end. All right, so check out the write-up, obviously, over on warchant.com. Gene's got a great breakdown, even more thorough, about how this class sort of uh, – came about and, and what they left on their mark here in Tallahassee. Go to Warchant.com. Use a promo code Warchant30 if you're not already a member to check out the Ultimate Semmel Sports Source. We're going to be back later this week. Gene, are we going to maybe do another party uh, 1999? We're going to party like it's 1999, maybe rewatch the nice, Sugar Bowl? Nice, nice Prince reference there. Yeah, I think uh, if I believe, we got to figure out the time, but yeah, the ACC Network's having an FSU day. Right. Uh, this Thursday, and I think one of the in that evening there will be Florida State Virginia Tech, and what what a fun game to talk about! A big Peter Warwick game. Um, you know, we got to try to do is get like P Dub, and I, it probably won't happen. P Dub or Winky to sit there with us in the whole thing and break it down. That'd be fun. But man, what a fun game to be! I don't know if you were at that game, Aslan, no, but no. that was an, that was an absolute back and forth game. Obviously, Michael Vick was ridiculous in that game, but Florida they just kept throwing blow haymakers at each other, but Florida State came out on top. Stay connected to warchant.com. Plenty more content, Florida State related, coming your way. For Gene and Maslon, thanks for watching.